This podcast is part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. Go to BigHeadsMedia.com for more great podcasts. This is Mike. And Beck. And Nina. And we are Brew Crime. So for this episode, we are going to do something a little bit different, I think. We're going to do an episode that cases are all based off of the Vancouver Police Museum. So it's actually a museum that's in the downtown east side of Vancouver. Most people are a little scared to go into the neighborhood because it can be a little rougher than normal. It's a bit sketchy. It's a little bit sketchy, but it's a... We I, Have either of you been there yet? I've been there twice. You've been, okay, I I've never I been there. Yeah, yeah. No. And I've heard all kinds of great things about it. it it's like a, it's basically a true crime museum. It's a museum about crime local in crime. Vancouver, local yeah. crime. And um, we hope to go there coming up in the fall, probably as, mm-hmm. as a group. Mm-hmm. But we thought we'd hit up some stories that are covered in this museum. Mm-hmm. So before we start, I kind of wanted to share a beer. Uh, I had been talking about this beer for a while. And it was so hard to get because it's out of Ontario. And Beck managed to get me a couple bottles of it. So, you know, when you're arrested, it's kind of a cock punch. <laughs> <laughs> so this beer is from uh, the Indie Ale House out of... Uh, Toronto proper. Is, is it Toronto proper? Okay. Yeah, Toronto. So it's Indie Ale House. It, this is the cock puncher IPA. So some beers should come with a warning label. This one does. A very big, strong, bitter imperial IPA with a bit of a punch. 11%. So we'll try this out and then we'll actually slide into the actual episode here. I just wanted to share this because something that Beck managed to find for me and I've been looking for this for years because the brewery hasn't made it for a couple years now. Joys of having Ontario connections. Yes. Well, since you got this for me, can you uh, get the first pour there? Sure. And Nina, you don't have to have any if you don't want to. You can have a little pour if you want, whatever you want to do. I love the label, too, because it's literally a rooster and a fist. Mm-hmm. Which I will be posting on our Instagram in <laughs> three, two. two, one. I actually had this shipped to my mom's house because they don't. Um, the brewery does not ship to BC with specific instructions for my mom to not open the box because I was worried she'd see an invoice that said, like, cock punch or something. The new Estildo coming out of Ontario. Oh dear! <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt it's it's a little rough for people that don't understand. Mm-hmm. And she sent it on to me after wrapping it in wallpaper, <laughs> and which would make it waterproof yeah. and um, fragile tape because she's lovely. Let's do a quick little review of this one. It is definitely a bit murky. It's not like a New England IPA, but it's not clear. It's like a deep orange, sort of an off-white head. It's got some like grapefruit kind of nose. There's no grapefruit in it. Cool. But it's kind of a citrusy grapefruit nose going on. A little resiny, maybe a hint of malt going on there. It's definitely boozy, but it's 11 fucking percent alcohol, so no it doubt. It does not taste like that, though. But it it's, is wily. It's got it's lots of grapefruit notes. It's got some pith in there from the citrus. It's got lots of tropical notes. It's sort of a pineapple-y thing going on. I would say for oh. the alcohol percentage, it's dangerously easy drinking. Oh, fuck yeah. I had, And it's got sort of a Belgian yeast going on there. It's, it's a little bit different. Um, I had this at a bottle share it's years tasty. ago and fell in love with it. And then I couldn't find it. And I couldn't trade for it. I tried. I was hunting down people in Ontario... Can you find this for me? Can we trade for it? Mm-hmm. And no one could find it. And it, it finally got re-released and Beck found it. And I was so happy when she brought the two bottles to me. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to save one bottle to share on the episode. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, it's dangerously good. It's not super bitter. It's It's got a bitterness, but it's mostly the fruit. And, yeah. Uh, I love a fruity beer. It, you know, it's not super sweet. There is sweetness, no. but it's a little yeah. bit dry. It's got lots of pith. It's got some resin in there. It's really well balanced. Super drinkable. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, now that we've uh, kind of hit up this beer, which I was super excited to share, we'll move into the first story. So I think this is going to be Nina, if I'm not wrong. 
You are not wrong. All right, so what story are you going to tell us about? So the story I'm going to focus on, or the serial killer that I picked, is Clifford Olson. One of the biggest. Biggest. Especially pre shithead Picton, he was the biggest in BC. Yeah, this story, um, I, th- I think, just for me, his kind of upbringing, all the things that he did, the, the plea deal he struck Somehow. is just, oh, I don't want to say best in Canadian history, but like most, one of the most mind blowing one next to, of course, um, Carla oh, Homoka and yeah, Bernard. Exactly, fucking bullshit. Which is fucking crazy. I, you know what? That's just, uh, don't even get me started on that one. But so for my pairing for C- Clifford Olson. Um, the beer that I picked, um, I guess I shouldn't say I picked it. So I mentioned in a previous episode that I usually go to Legacy Liquor Store, which is in Olympic Village. And the beer manager there, Chris, helped me actually select this one as well. I was originally drawn to it by the bottle, but then he kind of sealed the deal when he tied the name into the story. So the bottle itself is a brown bottle. <laughs> I know it's descriptive. But the picture of it is actually a skull. And then in the inside of the mouth of the skull is... A moth, so it's very similar to *The Silence of the Lambs*, which obviously is one of my favorite movies. Top classic, f- classic. Yeah. It's definitely that drew me to it. And when Chris had walked me over to this beer, he actually um, talked about the title *Drawn to Light* um, because Clifford Olson drew kids in. So I thought that was, you know, really eerie, creepy. Eerie yeah, it definitely is. Yeah. And um, to top it off as well, because obviously I had mentioned to Chris that. I'm going to be talking about Clifford Olson. He actually told me that one of his friends used to deliver groceries to him. And that just kind of spooked me out a little bit because I was like, what is, what are the chances of all of that? So yeah. So shout out to Chris. Um, Let's open this bad boy. And this is a driftwood brewing beer. Did you say that? I think so. Yeah. So shout out to uh, one of my uh, friends out at driftwood brewing, Julie Lavoie. Thanks for listening. Uh, We're glad you're a fan. So this one says that, from sleep's dark cloister, spinning uneasy, dreams of gone lives and long grass, this abbey ale has awoken to find itself transformed. Fresh hops, when young give way to barnyard rafters, with time, all things are become wild, wings unfold. The creature is drawn to light. So this beer is 7% alcohol? And uh, I don't think I mentioned Driftwood Brewing is from Vancouver Island. It's in Victoria, BC. And this beer is a nice kind of cloudy sort of golden yellow, white head. It's got kind of a sweet, fruity aroma. It's got kind of a Belgian nose. It's, it's, it's fruity. It's sweet. I'm not getting a lot of malt on the nose. There's like a, I don't know, there's an odd smell. Uh, well, you like, get that with the Belgian beers, right? It's you know, it's not Belgian, but it's a Belgian style beer. It's got a fruity, uh, fruity uh, flavor. It's got a hint of some grainy malts in there. Mm-hmm. It's got kind of that Belgian yeast esters. Um, very little bitterness. You're not tasting that seven percent alcohol at all. No, at least to me. And it, yeah, I mean, it tastes good, mm-hmm. but the yeah, the I should bouquet. just not smell beers because. What no. did you say it smelled like, Nina? No, you were saying you don't like the bouquet. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. There's something funky about it. Funky. Well, yeah, it's, but a lot of Belgian yeast have a bit of a funk to them. It tastes good, though. And, um, yeah, you don't... It's a higher alcohol percentage, but like you said, you don't really taste that. Yeah, no, it's super, super smooth. Mm-hmm. It's it's really easy drinking to be 7%. Mm-hmm. I really like this. Yeah, I could, I could drink a lot of this, which is probably a bad thing, but I'll do that. All right, Nina. So let's get into the story and crimes and just... Life the, and times yeah, of this shithead. The horribleness that is. Bunch of nonsense. Clifford Olson was born and raised in Vancouver, BC. He was actually born on New Year's Eve in 1940 in St. Paul's Hospital. Boo. Are you booing the hospital or his birth? His birth. Okay. Okay. The Just life and times there. of this shithead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He essentially spent most of his life going in and out of prison. In fact, he had about 94 separate arrests between 1957 and 1981. Which Holy I just think is shit. completely insane to yeah. me. Separate arrests? 94. 
Whoa. before this. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's just a scumbag Wait. through and through, right? Yep. Yeah. What what were those years? Uh, so that was from 1957 to 1981. Are you doing some quick maths? Yeah. Wait. What is my mom's birth year and my birth year? Wow. Yeah. So he worked what? a long time. And how many? 94. That's a lot. That's yeah. a lot. That's a lot of months working in crime. Yeah. When he was in school, he was remembered as a bully. He ended up actually dropping out of school early and living, as I said, a life of crime. Um, His record ranges from fraud, armed robbery, assaults to, of course, murder. During one of his stints in prison, he actually acted as a snitch and got a fellow inmate, um, Gory Marcru. I think it's M-A-R-C-O-U-X. Marcru, Marcro. Um. Say that again. M A R C O U X. I'm not 100 percent. Marco. Sure. Well, let's just go with fellow inmate sure. to write out a confession to rape and mutilation and the murder of a nine year old girl. Mm-hmm. Quick apology to everyone who actually speaks French. Yes. Yeah. But this guy was also an inmate, so I don't feel that bad. Well, okay. And he did rape, mutilate, and kill a nine year old. So. Then, this how can we brutalize his name? Okay, well, I don't care where your name is. Yeah. I hate your name. It. Your yeah. name doesn't fucking matter because mm-hmm. you're a piece of shit. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So Olson basically acted like a rat in jail and ended up getting a deal for himself to get out of jail by getting a confession out of this guy. Oh, wow. Yeah. During nine months of terror, Olson killed at least eleven kids and teenagers of both sexes, ranging in ages from nine to eighteen. The victim names are. Judy Kozma, who's 14, Darren Johnsrud, 16, Raymond King, 15, Simon Partington, 9, Ada Court, 13, Louis Chartrand, 17, Christine Weller, 12, Terry Lynn Carson, 15, Colleen Dignault, and I might not be pronouncing that correctly, she was 13, Sandra Wolfsteiner, 16, and Sigrun Arnd, 18. Oh my god. I hate him already. It's so Which is good, because you should fucking hate this guy. Yeah. Super awful, mm-hmm. and, you know, I think it still is, and I'm sure it was then as well, really uncommon for mass murder serial killers to have such a range of victims. Usually they would have one victim, yeah. if it's, you know, women, if it's males, or yeah. type of... Like a, yeah. Sorry, but a type. A type. So I think... You know, maybe even early in an investigation, it's kind of hard to pin maybe all of them on one person. Yeah, because it didn't seem like a the regular pattern. Not the regular MO, absolutely not. Olson's reign of terror is still one of the most known serial killers cases in Canadian history. Given the number of the victim, their ages, and honestly just the sheer brutality. In one month alone, uh, June 1981, he abducted, drugged, sexually assaulted, and murdered six of these children. Fucking hell. That's more than one a week. That's like one one and a half a week. Sorry. To yeah. Do the yeah. Half math, but you know what I'm saying. It is. I, I mean, and you know what, what led to that, right? Like through my research, I don't understand what escalated from, let's say the petty crime. So I don't want to say armed robbery is a petty crime, but petty crime in compared to comparison to rape, brutalization, murdering children. Yeah. yeah no, petty. I, yeah. What happened? What flipped the switch? You know what? And then plus... <laughs> this much, this much in such a short period of time, it's just completely just bone chilling. Yeah, for yeah. sure. In the early stages of investigation, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, RCMP, actually had Olson as a suspect. So early, in fact, he was considered a suspect after the first victim, Christine Wheeler, was abducted. Holy shit. Oh my god. From here, the awfulness continues. In November 1980, 12-year-old Christine Weller was abducted from home in Vancouver, a suburb of Surrey. Her mutilated body was found in the woods. South of town on Christmas Day, Colleen Daylaunt, who was 13, vanished from Surrey on April 16th. And 16-year-old Darren Johnson was abducted from a Vancouver shopping mall less than a week later and found dead on May 2nd. His skull was shattered by heavy blows. Fuck. On May 15th in 1981, Olson married his long-term girlfriend... This didn't stop his free or really even put a step in his pep or 
I don't know. It's amazing that these yeah. serious fucking sociopaths and psychopaths mm-hmm. can still find a time to find a partner. Mm-hmm. Well, and somehow. Well, and we were just talking about this in the last episode. Yeah. The like hyper dual life that yeah. you're living. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So four days actually after being. Uh, after getting married, he found abducted 16 year old Sandra Wolfsteiner. Uh, she was hitchhiking in Langley. That was the last time she was seen as well. Four days after getting married. Jeez. Fucking hell. Judy Kozma, who was 14, disappeared on July 9th. Her mutilated body was recovered from Lake Weaver near Agassiz in the Fraser Valley on July 25th. As I mentioned, he was already a suspect, and despite police surveillance, the police were unable to prevent him from claiming four more victims in the last week of July. Oh, my God. Stop ruining the amazing month of July, fucker. Well, they had him on, like, intermittent surveillance because they did have other active uh, suspects, but (laughs) I don't even know, right? Like, what what the hell are the chances of, I don't know, this nonsense? What year was this, though? Sorry? 81. Yeah, not exactly the technology that we have today. 15-year-old Raymond King disappeared from New Westminster on July 23rd. His body was recovered from the shore of Lake Weaver two weeks later. On July 25th, 18-year-old Sigrunt Arnd was abducted and killed while hitchhiking near Vancouver. Her remains uh, were finally identified through dental charts. Mm -hmm. I wonder what year it was like, don't hitchhike. You know what I mean? Because 60s, 70s, it was like how people got around yeah for sure well yeah. at what point was it like no don't well, don't do that thing i mean with this many abductions and this many things happening in such a short period of span mm-hmm. in 1981 i'm sure must have been the 80s. the lower mainland here for sure mm-hmm. got a bit of a wake up call yeah mm. terry carson vanished from the same surrey housing complex where christine wheeler had lived her corpse joining the list of those recovered from lake weaver on July 30th, 17-year-old Louise Chartrand disappeared while hitchhiking in Maple Ridge. Officers trailing Olson arrested him days later. He had actually picked up two female hitchhikers on Vancouver Island. The police had him under surveillance at this time and were worried of the safety for these two hitchhikers he picked up, so they finally pulled him over. The girls were unarmed, but a search of his van turned up an address book containing the name of Judy Kozma. Olson ended up being formally charged with her murder six days later. Olson started dealing with the prosecution, striking a bargain that would net his wife and child $10,000 per victim in return for m- information on four known murders. That's bullshit. Mm-hmm. That is fucking bullshit. And directions to the six outstanding bodies. I, I get like closure for the families, but... Well, there was a law that they cannot pay the inmate himself. So by him asking I don't for care. a trust for his... I know, but he they did it. And he actually offered a freebie, and I quote freebie as he called it, and gave them an 11th body, just to prove that he was a you know man of his words. He knows where these bodies are. That's still... what. So that's $100,000. That is correct. To his family. That is correct. Also wow. made good on his part the controversial deal and the money was paid on schedule um yeah so there was a trust fund set up that which his wife son hundred thousand dollars on january 11th in 1982 he pled guilty to 11 counts of murder and was sentenced to 11 consecutive life terms i fucking hate that i Mm -hmm. hate it so much yep he's obviously human garbage yeah but you know what so is she Mm -hmm. unless she donated that money to victims services or to the victims themselves i don't i get that i get that it's not i do get that it's not her fault yep but a hundred thousand dollars that's a joke i mean but even you know that his his son who's you know oh no obviously it's not but i mean how would you feel proud of like how would you how did you afford your education how did you do this oh my dad you know did this and this and this my dad is so and so I don't know. I don't know how. But you wouldn't. Bring no, that but up. you wouldn't. No, that's you would the hide thing. That. Just change his name and everything. How much do you want to bet he at least goes by the maiden name of his mother? Yeah, at least. I don't know. 
So there's a couple other crazy things that happened with this too. So on August of 1997, after serving 15 years of his sentence, Olson appeared in a Surrey courtroom asking for an early parole hearing. Well, under Section 745 of the Criminal Code, the so-called Faith Hope Clause, the clause dates back to 1976 when Parliament scrapped the death penalty and added a parole hearing for inmates that have served 15 years of a sentence. So based on this, he asked for early parole hearing. Yeah, yeah. Which the, is yeah bullshit. within his rights, but still, yeah. good luck, buddy. Well, the clause was seen as an incentive for good behavior, affording prisoners a parole hearing before they serve 25 years when a parole hearing is mandatory. The controversy surrounding Olson's request and the anguish it caused for his victims' families sparked a huge campaign to have the clause erased. When they had this um, parole hearing, it took them less than 15 minutes to come back and deny it. Obviously. Yeah, of course. Days after his 1997 parole hearing, the families and other opposed the clause staged a demonstration in British Columbia. The law was eventually amended to exclude serial killers. Good. That makes sense. Yeah. Yep. Another thing that, honestly, I tried to research a little bit and I got a little confused, but later in his life, it was also discovered that Olson was somehow still actually getting pension and he was still making money off his pension. So our, well, not mine because I was in Canada, but tax dollars were actually going towards his pension. So that, my understanding, was also removed because there's a huge outrage of that. You know, Mm -hmm. there's people here who are homeless, who are poor, who have nothing, who are fighting for these like social injustices that they're experiencing, money that they need, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. this mm-hmm. piece of shit is getting free money. Right, exactly. So that was also put to a stop. Good. Um, lastly, so September in 2011, media reports indicated that Olson had actually terminal cancer. He was transferred to a hospital in Laval, Quebec. He died on September 30th, uh, 2011, at the age of 71. One other thing I also had found is they kind of had, um, I don't know if it was like a prisoner profile, dating profile. I don't get it. But I brought it up just to share what his turn-ons are and turn-offs are. Oh, do you have a bucket, (laughs) Mike? Can I borrow? If we need one, I go get one, yeah. Okay, great. So I'll share a couple of things that he has listed. The sink's right behind you there, too. Okay, Just don't chandy on me, please. Okay, yeah. Turns on. Being with someone I love, Jesus Christ, oh, music, for fuck's sake. sexy women, champagne, sports, reading, philosophizing, writing, poetry, drawing, studying, learning law, being able to preach the message of God, having faith, hope and love, talking politics. As an atheist, I have no problem with anyone believing in a God or whatever they want to believe in. But when anyone has a record like this piece of shit Mm -hmm. and they try to, you know, claim their follower of this God or that God, like, fuck you. I mean, he obviously was, he's freaking insane. Yeah. Yeah, But I mean, you find this with all kinds of people. Uh, You're you're watching a certain political party in a certain country right now, Mm -hmm. United States, Mm -hmm. that keep claiming they're all this religious this and religious that. And you watch the bullshit that is spewed and the hate that is spewed in the name of God. And it's, pathetic yeah that's not like, what was intended what these, the intention of religion is supposed to be to love everyone mm-hmm. equally and you know what the idea of religion is beautiful it is unfortunately man is, has bastardized it's it. bastardized it and even if i don't believe in it the idea behind it is beautiful yeah it's just that it's been destroyed by all these fucking people they're doing these horrible things but claim that Oh, I love God. I love this and that. Like, fuck you. Mm -hmm. But even besides all that, I think that listing reading about God as a turn on. Yeah, it's turn off. That's weird. That's a weird. Good thing you said turn off. So let me list those. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Is God one of those things too? Mm -hmm. (laughs) For this fuck? I think his turn offs almost piss me off more than his turn ons. Oh, wow. (laughs) It's going to be good. It's going to be good. Turn offs. Being hurt by people you love. Oh, well, wow. I mean, <laughs> hold on, you. hold on. <laughs> Lies and deceitfulness. Mm. Swearing. Obnoxious people. Swearing. Fuck, 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 fuck you. Fuck, 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 fuck. Obnoxious people. Drugs. Procrastination. <laughs> people who are. Procrastination! Cra- <laughs> can, can we just, can we wait a second? I don't know. I don't think I'm ready to go on yet. <laughs> people who are proud. 
Selfish and rude, injustices and grudges. Injustices. I'm gonna hold a grudge wow. against this fucker. Hold on. Because... And his favorite flower is a rose. <laughs> okay, my turnoffs include hypocrisy. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> so yeah. Oh jeez. Yep. What a fucking lunatic douche. Canoe. Oh, that was golden though. Yeah. What a douchebag. Wow. There was a lot other th- <laughs> like a few other things, but um, I just. <laughs> Like, I literally can't even. Yeah, no, I can't mm-hmm. even either. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but his hobby, I mean, I can keep going. I've yeah, noted yeah, a yeah. few more things down. No, it's good. Favorite yeah. games are chess and bridge. Favorite colors, red. His hobbies include writing, poetry, and drawing. <laughs> mm-hmm. What a fucking idiot. And uh, the last one I ended up saving, too, is his favorite sports. Boxing, track and field, skiing, softball, hockey, swimming, skating, horse racing, tennis, and soccer. Oh, fuck you. Like everything. Yeah. Basically, he has the average sports fan of mm-hmm. most people. Go team. Mm-hmm. Go sports, um, fucker. Anyways, reading about this, everything with the kids, I just what a mon- monster. Yeah. Um, I don't think I actually even mentioned what it, like the monic that he got from this, but it was the Beast of British Columbia. Yeah. And, and he was definitely the Beast of British Columbia. Yeah. I definitely think he deserves that name. And I'm, you know, I'm glad that he's not part of this world anymore and that he can never ever hurt anyone again same yeah so yeah that's a story that i have today on clifford olson mm-hmm. i think that was my favorite from you procrastination wow okay injustices yeah injustices you fucking raped and murdered and drugged and kidnapped 11 children that we know about that you've confessed to yeah injustices can you use it in a sentence? Yeah. <laughs> if you want a little more information on Clifford Olson, go to Dark Poutine, which is another podcast from BC and Surrey. They're great. And they have, I think it might even be a two-parter on Clifford Olson. So check them out. Look for the Clifford Olson episodes and uh, tune in. They're great. And um, you'll get a lot of good info there. Sweet. All right. Let's move on to the next story. My milkshake brings my wife to the yard. The graveyard, that is. <laughs> yeah, that is ridiculous. I, I don't know it. what the hell I was expecting, but I just can't right now. Jesus Christ. I'm so tired. <laughs> my guards were down. This is a story about a shitty husband, a loving wife, and a medical community that nearly failed her. So this story was actually recommended by Christian, one of my buddies, and uh, shout out for being one of the first people that actually recommended a story. Thanks a lot, man. So the beer I chose for this one was the Russell Brewing Company Triple Berry Milkshake IPA because it's local and it's milkshake. And they're from Surrey. This is one of the coolest cans ever. It is yeah, so fun. It's, it's fun. fun. It's got like a woman with a sunday swirl sunday on top of her head it's got berries dancing it's got like a a cone with a bunch of berries in it mm-hmm. some lips we'll that are pictures. covered in like raspberry yeah. pictures available on all our usual a cat hitting a plum or something a milkshake ipa chock full of blueberries blackberries and raspberries sweetened with lactose and then it gets into real specific measurements that no one gives a shit about <laughs> A recipe that would rattle most jam companies. Blueberries, blackberries, and raspberries. Blackberries, raspberries, and blueberries. Raspberries, blueberries, and blackberries. It really says this. I'm not <laughs> that's okay. awesome. Yeah, that's triple berry. It's probably almost hundreds of pounds of berries or whatever in this batch. Oh, it's very pink. Oh, that's pretty. Being an IPA with lactose, it's going to be a New England IPA. It's going to be sweet because lactose is the milk sugar that cannot be broken down by uh, yeast. So it's got a nice cloudy, murky, sort of pinkish color, kind of a white head. It's got a semi-sweet nose. It's very berry forward. It's not super sweet, though, actually, on the nose. But it's basically, it's a semi-sweet berry. On the flavor, it's so many berries. It's it's the tr- it's all the berries. It's uh, a little bit of lactose. It's sweet, but it's not it's not like candy sweet. Yeah. Um, creamy. Creamy. There's lots of the fruity notes from the hops. 
There's not a lot of notes from the malts, really. It's pretty subdued. It's probably got lots of oats just because of how murky it is. But this is a really, really nice, really easy drinking, sweet IPA. Mm -hmm. There's no bitterness at all. There's a blackberry and a raspberry making out on the can. And dancing. And dancing. Yeah, I, I can drink a lot of this, and I'm sad I don't have any more of this in my fridge right now, so I'm going to have to go buy some. So why don't we move on to the uh, story? In 1946, Esther and Rene Castellani were 21-year-old newlyweds. By 1954, Esther gave birth to their daughter, Janine. Rene, a.k.a. the Dizzy Dialer, worked for CKNW and was well known for his outrageous on-air stunts. By 1963, Rene's stunts had become so elaborate that he once spent a week pretending to be a Maharaja who was in town to buy British Columbia. Okay. <laughs> yeah, like you do. Of course. Uh -huh. He rode around in limos with bodyguards and dancing women. Uh, he stayed at the Western Bayshore, or rather, the Maharaja did. I tried to find out why he did this, or who's paying for it, or, like, really anything about it whatsoever. Um, no, 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 couldn't find so much anything about it. Weird. Because he was just nuts. Yeah, someone had to be paying for it, though. The faux campaign was such a splash that locals started putting up signs in their yards stating, Keep BC British. Like, they were legitimately worried that this was a thing. Ah, uh, they're... Gullible. Doesn't matter where you are, there's a lot of deep-seated racism, and it sounds like it was happening right then and there. Well, I mean, regardless of racism, if someone were trying to buy a province, I'd be like, you're too rich, I don't like you. Yeah, yeah. But so, the whole keep BC British thing is... Well, I mean... Pretty bad. <laughs> British Columbia. Columbia. Yeah. I can think of some things the British did that weren't good for the province back in the day. <laughs> well, if some rich American came over and wanted to buy the province. I would say keep keep it Canadian, which is still kind of eh, That's but, fair. Yeah. Okay. Shockingly, Rene loved attention. <laughs> and uh, that didn't fade as he aged. At yeah. some point before 1965, he started an affair with a woman named Lolly. Esther found out in the fall of 1964 when she received a very unexpected and anonymous call from a woman one night who told her flat out that her husband was going around with someone else. This piqued her suspicion and she soon found a love letter in Renee's pocket from someone named Lolly. <gasps> yeah. Esther confronted Renee, who told her that she was being ridiculous and that whomever called was just trying to stir up some drama. Uh, I bet he even treated her to one of her favorites. A nice milkshake from White Spot. Aw, so sweet. Mm-hmm. Uh, for you non-locals, White Spot is a chain of family restaurants that basically doesn't exist outside of BC. Um, I think it's in Alberta, too. It's sort of the west of Canada. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. What? I'd never... I'd... I had... The Bing. BC Burger, yeah, duh. yeah. I, I'd never heard of it until I actually moved here. Uh, but it's a pretty big deal. Like in BC, it's a big deal, and everywhere else, it's like, wait, what? I don't know what that thing is that you're talking about. But in case you're wondering, the best white spot is on North Road in Coquitlam. Some of the locations even still have the drive-in service, so you mm -hmm. just pull up and you flash your lights, and the car hop person comes out with menus, and it's really fucking quaint. Anyway, it was shortly after this that her unexplained and mysterious stomach and lower back pain started. Uh, she had bouts of severe nausea and diarrhea. The pain became so severe and so frequent that Esther, who worked as a children's clothing store manager, started missing work, which was way out of the norm for her. Uh, her illness soon turned into intense pain and vomiting. Eventually, her fingers and toes went numb to the point that she couldn't use her hands or walk. Uh, she saw various doctors who provided a variety of diagnoses. 
One common thread was that she didn't have the best diet. Was it sodium retention, gallbladder problems? IBS. <laughs> the boogeyman. Your husband. Yeah. <laughs> Probably husband. But basically just a lot of bullshit. Yeah. That for it sure. was her fault and always. You know, but I mean like I think you'd go to like it's your fault versus like you're being poisoned. Which is what I'm assuming this is gonna lead to. I mean, spoiler alert. Yeah, jeez, come on now, ruin the fucking story. Well, she's just not lactose intolerant. <laughs> she doesn't have IBS. And, you know? IBS wasn't a thing then, was it? No, I don't, not know. Really. I don't think so. No, we didn't have bowel movements then. We just <laughs> right. It was a very secret. Yeah, we, just we were just of, we were all irritable we back sh- then. Yeah. Shit out of our spelly This was before the the children's book. Everybody poops. So <laughs> is that really a book? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's for potty book. training. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry, you're not expelling a demon. This is natural <laughs> body. Okay, now I know what to get Mike for Christmas. Sweet, please. Mm-hmm. By June of 1965, Esther was hospitalized. Over 100 tests and seven weeks in the hospital, and they still had no fucking answer. Pardon my language, but what the hell. Around this time, you'd think Rene would be at his wife's side. But he was pretty busy at work. Um, He was parked in a car on top of the Bomac sign on West Broadway until every car on the car lot was sold. Priorities. Um, Is that not now the uh, Toys R Us sign? Sorry, sorry. Patience. Uh, It took eight or nine days, depending on which source you trust. But the Bo Mac sign is still there on Broadway, but the car lot is long gone, and it's a Toys R Us now. Yes, America, we still have that here. They haven't gone bankrupt here yet. Mm -mm. Give it two years. Yeah. Uh, When Rene did bother to visit his wife in the hospital... Uh, he was extremely impatient, to say the lace. He asks nurses' aides, how much longer will Esther live? Wow. And when Esther's mother asked him if he had any idea what could be causing her illness, his response was, this is a quote, when a house burns down, I don't look for a fire. I look her around to build a new house. What the fuck? 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 (laughs) Uh, That is weird. You are human garbage. So because his wife is dying, he's just trying to find a new wife and move on. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Mm -hmm. I've met people like that. I don't like them much. Mm -hmm. And that's what he said to her mom. This is her mom. By July 1965, Janine was 11 and really missing her mom. On July 11th, her father told her that he had to go to the hospital. She thought he was finally bringing her mother home. But when he came home, he just told her that Esther had passed away. An autopsy was performed, and the medical examiner determined that the cause of death was heart failure and a viral infection of unknown origin. There was one man that wouldn't accept this, Dr. Bernard Moscovich. He knew that there had to be... A better explanation than poor diet. Obviously, because that's ridiculous. Anyway, he went over Esther's medical records. He became sure that toxicity had killed her, so he sent some of her stored tissue samples for further testing. Lo and behold, they found arsenic. Bum, bum, bum. This was enough to have Esther's body exhumed. They tested her hair and found that she had been consuming arsenic for more than six months leading up to her death. Can't imagine that. Like, anyone, presumably all our listeners, who listen to true crime podcasts or have read about whatever, you know what kind of torturous death arsenic is. Like, Mm -hmm. the fucking worst. It is not a good time. But this doesn't make sense, because um, Esther did all the cooking at home. So where did all the arsenic come from, right? Hmm, let's see. She made all the meals, but what was coming from outside the house? Bags of almonds? What? Huh? Yeah. What's going on? Yeah. The white spot conspiracy? What? What? It was just those innocent milkshakes from her ever loving husband. I'm oh. sure it's completely unrelated. Uh, ice cream safe? What? The Yeso brought her favorite milkshakes to the hospital, thoughtful soul. Oh, what a. Thoughtful individual. Mm-hmm. I think the word you were looking for is douche canoe. <laughs> Probably, yeah, totally. <laughs> of 
It still took months to arrest Rene. What finally pushed suspicion into motive? The police found out about Rene's affair with, quote, Lolly. Her real name was Adelaide Miller. Oh, it wasn't Pop? Mm, No. (laughs) A lollipop? Uh, She was a young mother, widowed when her husband drowned in a boating accident. She was the receptionist at the radio station where Rene worked. But how did they find out? It was easy. Just days after Esther's funeral, Rene, that thoughtful soul, took Janine, Lolly, and Lolly's son to Disneyland. Not white spot? No. Nice uh, family vacation four uh, days after his wife's well, yeah, funeral. Well, yeah, his house burned down, and now he built a new one. Exactly. As soon as they got back to town, they all moved in together in a house that Lolly and Renee had looked at in June when Esther was still alive. Fuck me. Yeah, what the... The police also found a box of Trilox weed killer under the sink. Key ingredient? Arsenic. But how could they be sure it was the milkshakes? Well, wouldn't you know it, those nine days that Renee was on the Bomax sign? No arsenic in her system. You don't say. Because you can measure it, right? Yeah. Curiouser and curiouser. CNKW soon fired Renee, and the police arrested him quite shortly after that. By the beginning of April, Renee and Lolly applied for a marriage license. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, no, that's not suspicious. Go for that. The elation of their upcoming nuptials was short-lived. Renee was arrested for murder on April 6, 1966. Jeanine was sure that her father was innocent. So sure, in fact, that she committed perjury multiple times during his trial. She was just a kid, right? So Yeah, yeah, it happens. She was alone, and she just wanted to keep someone familiar with her. The trial only lasted nine days. The prosecutors presented 40 witnesses in those nine days. Renee's defense presented zero witnesses. Not great. Um, no, not, not great at all, yeah. They didn't, like, not even Rene himself was a witness. Rene was convicted and sentenced to death. A new trial was ordered shortly after based on procedural errors. Which makes sense. I mean, they basically did nothing at all in the first (laughs) trial. Exactly, yeah. At the second trial, Rene was asked one question by his lawyer, Charles McLean. Quote, Rene Castellani, look at the jury. Did you murder your wife, Rene? Rene then swiveled his chair towards the jury and said, quote, I did not. It's a bit dramatic. A little bit, yeah, a little bit. I wonder how many times they practiced it, though. Like, was there <sighs> so many chair swivels? Did he get dizzy? I don't know. I wish my chair had a swivel right now so I could do some practicing mm-hmm. myself. Charles had a flair for the dramatic. In his closing statement, he said, quote, If you're going to hang men for adultery, there aren't enough lampposts in Vancouver to accommodate them. You're getting fucking... For adultery, you're getting fucking hung because you poisoned your wife. Yeah. Yeah. Idiot. (laughs) Wow. The show had little effect on the second jury. Renee was convicted again and sentenced to hang January 23rd, 1968. On November 30th, 1967, a five-year moratorium on the use of the death penalty was voted in, so Renee's death sentence was commuted to life in prison. Or in his case, 12 years. Esther lived in agony for months so that he could marry his girlfriend without having to go through a divorce, not to mention that he took a mother away from his daughter and he only served 12 years. Vomit. Why 12? He got paroled after 12 Shut years. Shut the front door. Yeah, 12 death years. Death penalty to 12 years. Yeah, he went from death penalty and then Canada got rid of the death penalty. Which okay, I fine. personally support, but, but he then should never he get got, out. He got paroled after 12 years. Death penalty should be minimum 25 to life in yeah. Canada. Because that's our worst worst thing we do. Mm-hmm. So, I don't have any comments on this. <laughs> why not just get a divorce, right? Yeah. 
That's uh, the easy way. Yeah. Well, it was a lot harder at the time to get a divorce, especially for women. She would have had to prove adultery as well as either domestic violence, incest, or bestiality to, like, if Esther had have requested a divorce, she, that's what she would yeah. have done. And it also would have been published in the local news. Like, you had to advertise that kind of thing in the newspaper. Yeah. It's kind of fucked up. Yeah, so that is. would have completely messed up his so precious image that he thought he had. Well, and the worst part there is that he may not have been physically violent, so it may not have been obvious. He poisoned her with fucking no, milkshakes. That is physical that's violence. Still, wait, like. He's not physically beating her. So it's no, not but obvious. He, he could have left her oh, no, but without having to oh, prove any of those is, things because he has one a of penis. These old school douche canoes that can't just leave her because that would hurt his pride. So he has to kill her. You know, he's garbage. Yeah, he is garbage. Yeah. Upon release, Rene tried to get back to his radio career, but fate had other plans. Only three years after his release, Rene Castellani died of cancer, and that's the story of the dipship dealer. Oh, Dizzy Dialer, whatever. I feel really bad that the last two episodes, there's been cases of cancer that I've cheered for. I don't feel bad. Uh, I mean... You know what I mean? I do know what you Do you think mean. they felt bad for their victims? No. no I just fucking hate cancer so much, but... Yeah, well, sometimes yeah. good people get cancer, and sometimes fucking assholes like this get it, right? So oh, yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just yeah. weird. But I looked up a couple of images for white spot, and this yeah. was the original white spot sign. Yeah. As long as you share this photo on for the website, yeah. I'll share it. Yeah. It looks like a, a chicken a with white spot written on his chest, and I think he's been smoking pot or something. It kind of reminds me sleepy. of that kick in the cock we had earlier. Yeah. <laughs> or cock punch, sorry, cock punch. And actually, just to, just to bring it back around to here, because as much as he was a piece of shit and he poisoned the uh, milkshakes, my wife's favorite restaurant is White Spot. They are in BC and Alberta. They also, on their secondary brand, which is the, uh, where is it here? I'm going is it Triple here. O's? Triple O's. Triple O's is available in um, the basement of Pacific Place. And the Exchange Square in Hong Kong Island, Harbor City Shopping Mall in... Basically, there's a couple places in Asia, BC on Alberta. Yeah, there, I... There was a place in Seoul, South Korea. I don't know if it's still there. It was in 2008. So it's basically BC on Alberta is where uh, White Spot or Triple O's is located. Okay, White Spot, I'm fully on board with. Love White Spot. Great family restaurant. Triple O's... It's a hard pass for me. Not really. I still think Triple O's is better than most fast food restaurants out there. Doesn't matter. Hey guys, this is Nina of Brew Crime. Have you heard about the PodCoin app yet? This is the first podcast app that will actually pay you to listen to your favorite podcasts. You can find the podcast app on Android and iPhone, and not only is it free, but it's really simple to use. While listening to podcasts, you gain PodCoins that can then be used to buy gift cards or even be donated towards charity. So either give to a good cause or get a gift card for places like Amazon or Starbucks. You're already spending time listening to podcasts. Why not make some money while you're at it? If you use the invite code BREWCRIME, one word, no spaces, you can even earn 300 bonus pod coins just for signing up. So head over to your app store and give PodCoin a try now. So my story is titled Babes in the Woods. And uh, this is not the only Babes in the Woods that's out there. But this is the one for the British Columbia market. It is the one that is at the VPD Museum. There are multiple young children that have been found in the woods, but that's the one I'm going to cover here. So this is an unsolved murder. So unsolved murders are always tough, and this one has been unsolved since the 1950s. So the beer that I have paired with this story... It's from Stanley Park Brewing, and that'll tie into this whole story. This is the Windstorm West Coast Pale Ale, 5.4% alcohol. It says that it's tropical fruit and citrus, hop characters, medium body, full flavor. I'm not sure if this is still the case, but when this beer first came out, 
a portion of all proceeds went towards the um, replanting of trees in Stanley Park because we had a horrible windstorm that knocked down a ton of trees in Stanley Park. 2006 or seven, Something like that, yeah. yeah I remember so that. It was, it was, was a massive, massive thing. Oh, my God. Well, I was in high school because high school got closed because a tree fell right oh, by, by the doors. Oh, my God. Yeah. That was when I moved to BC. <laughs> well, oh, I feel like Nina. the story only makes oh, one Nina. of us old. Yeah. <laughs> I One of us has to be old. young. It's okay. You. But um, it, it's a cool story regardless. A lot of money went to the Parks Board of Vancouver to replant a lot of the trees. Yeah. yeah. And um, this is the Windstorm Pale Ale. So the beer pour is a mildly cloudy copper or orange. It's got kind of an off-white head. Very mildly fruity nose. A little bit of maltiness to it. It's a pretty subdued nose, though. The flavor is quite citrusy. Uh, some definite, definite pith from the citrus. There's a background of some kind of maltiness. But it, it's definitely more of a citrus pith up front. It's, it's definitely a pale ale that's trying to be more West Coast. But not a lot of bitterness, though. But it's a nice beer, though. Um there's nothing wrong with it. It's not super exciting. It's not super adventurous. Yeah. But it's definitely easily drinkable. Mm-hmm. It's a beer that you're you're not going to turn away if it's given to you. Yeah, it's like a mainstream craft. Oh, definitely. Yeah, it's it's crafty kind of thing. Yeah. In 1953, on January 14th, a Vancouver Parks Board employee, Albert Tong, was walking through Stanley Park. When his life would change forever. He came upon a patch of leaves that made a weird crunching sound near Beaver Lake. He would dig beneath the leaves and brush and was horrified to find many bones in the earth below. He would head to a phone and contact the authorities as this was decades before cell phones. Even pagers. Mm -hmm. In the morning of the next day, police and investigators would show up. To the Prospect Point area of Stanley Park to dig up the bodies that had been found. And we all know Stanley Park very well. Mm-hmm. It is one of the most popular places in Vancouver to go, right? Yeah, in the summer I'm almost there every weekend playing baseball, so it's a thing. Mm-hmm. It definitely is a thing, yeah. I'm definitely there to cheer on everyone playing baseball most weekends. In the soil, police would find a rotting fur coat as well as the bones of two children and a hatchet. And I say rotting kind of loosely. It was really decayed, but it's kind of the feeling I got from everything I read was that was the right word to use. Mm-hmm. Um, so a part of the bones and the hatchet are actually still on display at the mu- museum? Wow. We'll get to that. Okay. Yeah, we'll okay. get to that. Sorry. No worries. It would become clear that the hatchet was the murder weapon. One child had a wound that matched the hatchet blade, and the other had a crushed skull likely from the handle of the hatchet. They would also find the children's aviation caps, goggles, children's clothing, a lunchbox, and one woman's size seven and a half penny loafer. Today, the police would call in a forensic pathologist, botanist, or the likes and try to identify the victims. Back in 1953, though, things were different, sadly, and they called in a doctor. The doctor would note that the bones were of a young boy and girl being between 5 and 7 and 7 and 9. Detectives of the time would come to the conclusion that the bones had been in the woods for around 6 years, which would make the murder in the area around 1947. After the discovery of the body, the police would call on the local public to try and help identify the children, and in turn, hopefully, the murderer. They would ask specifically if anyone had seen a woman in Stanley Park walking with two children in and around 1947. Tips would come in fast and furious, but every one of the hundreds of calls would lead to a dead end. That's a long damn time. Mm -hmm. It is, yeah. Especially at a big park like that, too. Well, yeah, all the women and people are here with their kids. It's, it's really giving it's much like, to go okay, on. okay, yeah, every day. Yeah. 
I don't want to be too gruesome, but six years? Nobody smelled anything? I don't know. No one reported two children missing. It's a big but park. It, it's a very big park, right? There's it a is lot a of, big park. There's a lot of wild spaces in that park. Yeah. But, I mean, stink spreads. And as far as the mother not reporting anything, I guess I just think that if they were found and with the coat over top... Maybe it was the mom? Yeah. We'll get to that, too. The police collected all of the bones... While collecting the evidence, they kept these bones inside two boxes. There would be a report written, but nothing would come of it. This case would come up once in a while, but would go cold until 1996. It was this time when Sergeant Brian Honeyborn would end up the head of the Provincial Unsolved Homicide Unit. He was able to choose what case he wanted to work on, and this was the case that came to mind for him because it was the case that fascinated him as a child. The first step was to find all of the evidence in this case. This meant finding a box of bones at the Vancouver Police Museum. He used this evidence to reanalyze the bones using current technology. While information is still taken from the report that was produced in 1953, Sergeant Honeyborn is of the opinion that some of the information could be wrong, such as dates and other portions of the facts presented. Much of that is due to having a doctor and not a forensic botanist review the crime scene, but this position did not exist back when this was um, happening. He is of the opinion that the bones could have been hidden for many more years than was originally thought. Having the bones stored in boxes also led to degradation of the evidence, unfortunately. Now they use special bags because the boxes have acids that could help degrade the bones and evidence. Once the bones had been collected by Honeybarn, he got in contact with Dr. David Sweet, who was a professor at University of British Columbia. He happened to specialize in the field and was able to extract DNA from the teeth and bones of the children's skull. This testing would throw the entire case on its head. The two children that had been murdered were in fact not a boy and a girl, but actually two boys. It would also be proven that they were both brothers from the same mother, but they did not share the same fathers. Now, of course, this absolutely changes the search parameters of this very old case, as they are now looking for two small boys who were seen with a woman in Stanley Park. Lots of new and compelling leads would pop up over the next few years, and he would pursue them. These are as follows. There was a woman with two young boys that stayed at the New Haven Hotel, but the boys went missing. There was a mother with two children hitchhiking for mission to Stanley Park, and these two boys had aviation helmets. She claimed to be having issues with the mission police. At least one of the boys likely went to Cedar Valley School. And then, it could also have been an alleged sex worker living with her two sons, and a father at Prospect Point in a lighthouse in Stanley Park. Her children disappeared, but it, they were not looking into a boy and a girl at the time, so they did not follow up on this. Right, right. And then a woman was seen with two children and a man carrying a hatchet into the woods in Stanley Park. She would only return <laughs> with the man later. Not reported sooner? Yeah, no. What the... Yes. I thought they were playing weird tag. Like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's ridiculous. In a twist, you would not expect all cases above were proven to be incorrect, as all children were found to be still alive at the time, and there was also no way the dates would have lined up with the possible murder dates. Okay, wait. I feel like I need to know what happened with the family going into the park with a hatchet and coming out as a couple. And that that was not a weird thing. <laughs> oh, it was weird, but it was proven that those kids were still alive somehow. Mm-hmm. Horseshit. Oh, no, no. The, the police did look into this. And no, they, yeah, they yeah, I get it. But I'm like, somehow. under what circumstances do you enter a park with two parents and the parents leave the park with hatchet without kids? Especially and in it's the still 40s okay. Or 50s. <laughs> 
If anyone has any ideas, speculation, wild, cool, send them in. Because I have no idea how that could be a thing. Neither do I. So, this is some pretty impressive police work in itself, really. How do you find out what happened in the 40s or 50s? Uh, Yeah. Fuck. Uh, Yeah. He also worked on a report of a woman running without shoes in a deranged state in 1944. I mean, I saw that last weekend, but... (laughs) But if she was deranged, she would have likely been picked up and brought to the hospital in Vancouver. And after a psych evaluation, she would have been sent to the now closed Riverview oh. uh, Riverview Essenade or Riverview Psychiatric Hospital in Coquitlam. Mm-hmm. Haunted. Uh, fortunately, no mention of this could be found by him. Not one. Well. There was also a report of a woman wearing only one shoe running out of the forest that approached a couple in a, in distress and then let out a guttural roar. This was again in the 1940s. This could have some credence as she was only wearing one shoe and a shoe was found with the children. And, and then what happened? Nothing. What? We're working on it. To show some respect to the two boys, Honeyborn cremated the majority of the boys' bones and released the ashes into the sea from a police boat as part of a small ceremony at Kitts Point in 1990. Mm. It happened to be on the same day as a local children's festival. Oh, shit. Oh, my oh. God. It's almost a... Oopsie like, poodle. It's, no, it's, it's almost like a good thing. Like, releasing it... These, trying to help release these kids, if you believe in religion and all that, releasing their souls or something on the day of a children's festival, like supposed to be a good day for children i can see that being a, a good day to do yeah. this okay i'm I, yeah i don't believe in all that but if you do i can see it being a good thing well i mean religion spiritualism are very separate things i'm not either but yes it is totally different very different things here's a quote from him i'm not overly religious but i know that being on display in a museum was not a proper place for a burial which is fair. So I, I, I agree seized them that. out of the museum and had them cremated. He hoped to bring some sort of closure to poor little boys. Mm-hmm. Not everyone liked what he did, and he was quoted as saying, I got some criticism for doing this, and some people asked why they didn't scatter their ashes in Stanley Park. But I told them, these kids what? were murdered there. Yeah. Why would they want to be buried there? Exactly. I guess you can't please everyone. He did save bones for future DNA testing, though. At the Vancouver Police Museum, there are now replicas of the boys' skulls and bones. Mm -hmm. Since that time, Sergeant Brian Honeyborn retired in 2001 without being able to figure out the identities of these two boys. A Staff Sergeant Dale Weidman from the VPD now hopes to put the DNA samples into the consumer database like Ancestry.com and 23andMe and see if the boys' identities can be finally be revealed. They can hopefully take their information they gain to track back from current relatives to name the two boys that suddenly disappeared from schools in B.C. in and around 1940s. Like with the Golden State Killer. Yeah. They know there will never be a prosecution at this point. The person would be long dead by now. But they do hope they can finally crack the case of the two boys. Now retired Sergeant Brian Honeyborn still has binders at his house of the notes from the investigation that he goes through once in a while, and he thinks about his 33-year career at the Vancouver Police Department. I hope one day these boys' identities can be figured out, but it is really sad to think that they died in the 1940s, and we are now really no closer to knowing who they were. Yeah. But that's one of the most compelling cases, too, at right now at the Vancouver Police uh, Museum. Yeah. It, it's... It's an unsolved case from the 40s, mm-hmm. and there's really still no real leads on what happened. I don't know. I feel like this is one of those stories that we're just we're going to have never going to know what actually oh, happened. Oh, we, we will never know what really I happened. I mean, if they haven't even identified who it was, mind you, who did it is mm-hmm. not even, unfortunately, never going to get justice for that. What, uh, I don't know if this is weird, but what struck me out about the display they have at the uh, Vancouver Police Museum on this topic is the the hatchet that they have on display there it's shockingly small 
Like it's, you think of a hatchet, if you could shrink it to half its size, yeah. it's it's so tiny. Well, they kept on calling it a certain kind of hatchet in all my notes, and I had no idea what that, ha- that name meant, so I left it out. And it could be a miniature hatchet style or something. But every I mean, time I put a that hatchet, name it, in, it's a tiny axe. And then is there a smaller version of it? Um, I, mean, I don't know because every, every everything I did in the research related to this weird something hatchet, and I didn't understand what the hatchet was, and I couldn't find out what it was. So I left it out because if I can't corroborate it, I don't want. Yeah. I don't want to add it. Yeah. Did you try Googling it? Oh, I Google a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I did Google a lot. The Google. The Googs. Mm-hmm. I can't wait to go to this museum. Mm-hmm. It, it sounds like a cool place. It's got a recreation of the morgue. It's got things about the cases we've talked about today. Mm-hmm. It's got lots of other cases, too. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I want to call out. Uh, I've noticed that you, you follow us now, Dark Poutine. I'd love to get together with you guys at maybe the Vancouver Police Museum. So I'll see if we can make that happen. Mm-hmm. And maybe in the fall here, maybe we can make it a meetup or something. Mm-hmm. They do um, adult only night tours. Ooh, even and better. And they do spooky ghost tours. <gasps> and, Shut the front door. And, uh, but even the daytime stuff. I mean, the staff there is amazing. Yeah. Everyone's super cool. It's just a, it's really nice. I mean, it's a cool Atmosphere. place to go. Yeah. So, Dark local Poutine, tourism. We're going to be hitting you up. Let's try to do something in the, uh, the fall here. Mm hmm. I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and if you live in the Metro Vancouver area or Fraser Valley, Mm -hmm. go check out the Vancouver Police Museum, because it sounds like an amazing place. Beck seems to really enjoy it. She's been there multiple times now. It's cool. And um, thanks for listening. Mm -hmm. So if you enjoy our episodes, if you want to find us on social media, you can go to Brew Crime on Twitter and on Instagram. You can go to Facebook on either the groups or the pages and go to Brew Crime. You can find us on our store at brewcrime.threadless.com and you can buy our shirts, our hoodies, a blank, like a beach blanket or beach towel. Everything. Everything, basically, yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, well, you can go to brewcrime.com to check us out and keep listening. And if you have any cases you want us to cover or themes you want us to cover, hit us up at brewcrime at pacificbeerchat.com. If you like brew crime and like to support us, you can go to patreon.com slash brew crime where you'll get early access to our episodes and that will be ad free as well. We use the money from Patreon to, to both upgrade our equipment and just try to bring our show to the next level. Uh, we'd like to shout out our current Patreon supporters. So we've got our first was the faves of our lives. Then we've got three beers in podcast, Amber. We've got Nina's mom and our newest Patreon supporter, Ange. So if you'd like to be just like these people, go to patreon.com slash brewcrime and sign up now. We have different levels. You can get some stickers. You can get a t-shirt. If there's a level you'd like to add that we don't have, just let us know and we'll add it. So thanks for listening and cheers. Brew Crime's intro was created by Mike using Creative Commons Attribution Licensed Audio from purple-planet.com, soundbible.com, and freesoundeffects.com. Logo design was by Ben Greenberg. All cases and stories were written by Beck, Nina, and Mike, and our sources are put into the show notes for each episode. We always want to give credit to the people that research the cases we talk about. Check out our store at brewcrime.threadless.com where you can purchase swag like t-shirts, phone cases, beach towels, and all kinds of cool stuff. We can also be found on your favorite podcast apps, our hosts, Spreaker.com or BrewCrime.com, as well as at BrewCrime on Twitter, at BrewCrime on Facebook, at Facebook.com slash groups slash BrewCrime. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Pacific Beer Chat. Here's a promo from one of the podcasts in the Big Heads Media Network. Oh, hey, I didn't see you there. I'm Swanson, host of the TV Tuners podcast. Every week on TV Tuners, me and my co-host, Kyo Rain, Swanson, I need water. And Stairmaster. <laughs> review the latest in TV, discuss news, trailers, and even find time to play some fun games. Right now, we're working overtime to cram as much TV knowledge into our brains as possible. Isn't that right, guys? <laughs> Swanson, we've been here for 24 hours. We need to get out of here. Not until you answer who Norm is. 
he's Frazier's brother! Wrong. You get the shock. <gasps> Check out TV Tales, available on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, or any of the podcatchers of your choice. Hi, it's Audra, Jason, and Matt from Drinkopedia Podcast. We're a bad education podcast that's like drunk history for the full curriculum. We have new episodes every Thursday, and you can find us on most major podcast platforms. Join us at the bar and follow us on Twitter at Drinkopedia Pod. Where is it in Ontario? Shit. Is that Ontario? I don't see where... Shit, Ontario. Is. That's in Canada. <laughs> no, it's not. I, I, yeah, where is it? Beck's looking it up right now. It's in, like... 11% IPA, or 11% IBU, or ABV, I can speak. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Nina's oh. making faces. Oh. <laughs> it is strong. Wow. You guys are not fucking around. Mm-hmm. It's 11%. It's, you're not messing around with this beer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We, don't, we don't have your beer, beer. It's right there. It's right there. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> Got my line here. It's okay. So, we'll just start that again. I picked a beer. <laughs> oh, shit. Um... So, two things about the bottle. Uh, That's a lie. One thing about the bottle, one thing about the name. (laughs) So, (laughs) the title is... uh, The title. The name of the beer. So, it's by Driftwood Brewery. Can we just start all that again? Yep. Completely. Before you start again. That's hard to read because it's not good English. (laughs) It sounds like poetry. It does. Maybe I should have read it. Want to read it? (laughs) We can do it again. Let's try this again. Take two. Take two. Wait, wait, wait. And action. Yeah. Oh, no, it's got it? kind of a. It's <laughs> I got, said farts. Yeah, I lied. It's, like it's got no. I don't. I don't get any farts on there myself. Like I a don't. cup fart. Really? Dutch ovens. <laughs> Dutch I'm not. Get, I'm not getting any salt for myself on this, which is an which is an off aroma and flavor you can get. But I, personally, I'm not getting that. I don't know. No. Okay. <laughs> Life and times of no. Having a clog dance upstairs or something, I think. Amber's in the kitchen too. Sorry. No, but it's the <laughs> the kids upstairs. <laughs> dun, 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 okay, I'll start. Oh, wait one second. Having yeah. like a clog relay yeah. race, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Philophysize it. I can't even say it. Just trying to pull something up here. One quick. One sec. One quick. <laughs> one quick. One alcohol. And it spit up on my phone. Woohoo! Lollipop. Esther. Lollipop. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay. Go ahead, if you want to. No, that's all I know, actually, that part. Boom, 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 boom. boom. Milkshake, milkshake. (laughs) Well, like... Yeah. Oh, my God. Cut point for a second. Is it Muscovich? Muscovich. Do you want to just pretend I I said it right the first time? Say it again, and say it wrong again. You say it again so I can cut it out easier. Can I just pretend I said it right the first time? You could do that, too. Yeah, I'm cheating. So just pretending you're saying my okay. last name. Okay. So cut here. We're That's gonna cut out that. Nina's name. It's stupid name. that I pronounce it that way, actually, Although, because I know how your last name is. At the is same pronounced. point. Convicted again and sentenced to hang. Jane. What happened? I don't know. Oh. We're dead. We went blank. Sorry. We're recording fine, but we just lost the headphone app. I'm just gonna start that again. Sentenced. You were saying sentenced to hang. Yeah, that's okay. The show had little effect on January... No. No January. Forget that. Esther lived in agony... No, that's not a word. This would also find the children... Or the children's appear... Uh, much of that is a doctor and not a forensic patat... Patat. Much as that... Then was religious. Now, they used special... Ba- she claimed that they had to be... Uh, 